Let's rock and roll, boys. Welcome to another Nintendo podcast. My name is Matt Schultz, and I'm host today, and I'm joined by Austin Cummings. Hey, Matt. And Danny Tortelli. Hi, Matt. And today we're going to talk about some big and in the news. How was that, Austin? Very good. That was awesome. It sounded great. Thank you. All right. So we have a couple of things to talk about today, and I think it'll mm. fill out this short but sweet episode. Um, we got a little bit of. Uh, Mario Odyssey news, um, just uh, kind of some commentary on Nintendo's 130th birthday, wow. and uh, finally kind of wrapping things up with Nintendo's recent VR stuff announcement. Wow. So. Wow. Here we go. Off the rails. Here we go. We're going to jump right into it. Uh, uh, Super Mario Odyssey is getting a 360-something page Dark Horse uh, published book about all of its uh, beautiful, lovely art, all encompassing uh, the, the wonderful creations that the Nintendo team came up with and either did or did not make it into the game. So Austin, take it away. What, what, is, what is happening well, with Matt, this I would just like book? to say that I appreciate it. What, what's this art book all about? And, and bigger question, are video games art? Let's dig into it here at <laughs> A&P. I would like to say yes. for the uninitiated, I like the idea of when you say it's the Dark Horse art book that maybe it's like, this is their edgy alternative, maybe Hot Topic brand where they're like, <laughs> hey, hey, you know Mario? Like, what if, hey, you eat the mushrooms, right? <laughs> <laughs> in any event. Uh, so this art book is one in the line of the Dark Horse uh, art books. I just announced it for release uh, in the West uh, in a few months here. And what it, why it is significant is uh, you, the people of the internet, may have seen it a few months ago when it was kind of the unveiling uh, when it released for Japan of good old Bowsette, uh, oh our, one, our wonderful champion, uh, it's when the Toadette uh, Peachette controversy from new Super uh, Mario Brothers uh, U Deluxe, <laughs> uh, new 3DS, 2DS. Plus. Uh, I think you only said half the name. Yeah. <laughs> was, was announced. That's when we first saw that artwork. Anyway, that's uh, some of the content within this book, as well as, and if you click on the Polygon story where we're drawing this information from, there's this very cool uh, look at hmm. the kind of Mexican-inspired uh, sand kingdom that uh, Mario visits on his uh, Odyssey. But it has like this really cool uh, Mexican-American kind of Western vibe to it, where like the poncho hmm. is like kind of flowing in the wind. He looks like kind of the kind of a lone gunsman. Uh, it just it, it's always so fun to see these art books, and I will say that I've been guilty of buying a great many of our books, some of which still sealed in their plastic sitting right near me. Yeah, I have and, a high rule historia. I'm sure you have that too. And Danny, you've you've kind of perused that a bit. Um, but it's been a cool partnership that Nintendo's no. had with Dark Horse for a while now, um, coming no. out with this stuff for the true Nintendo fan. Oh, check that out! Oh, very fun Splatoon. This is also by our friends at Dark Horse, which is a local company. I'm here in uh, Lake Oswego, Oregon. But uh, in any event, here uh, here on the YouTube version, we have the Splatoon art book. And yeah, they're really nice, uh, large, hardcover wow. books that kind of break down the art. And here's the thing. Um, I told myself that I enjoy buying games digitally because I'm like, oh, it reduces the clutter. You know, it's like I'm more, <laughs> more of an adult. I can kind of put everything in their nice place with all the, these cases around. But then I'm like, man, I could really use some physical goods. And so I often <laughs> find myself buying these art books. And uh, I guess we'll see. I'm going to tune back into a p come a few months, and we'll see if I've done it again, ladies and gentlemen. We need to see, like, uh, your, you know, your bookshelf. You need to do, like, an a and vlog of, we need like, <laughs> Austin's room. A&P Let's Read. Right. a and Storage Wars. Where we We've been staring at your wall. Mm -hmm. No, that would be something. But that would be, like, kind of a reckoning I myself can't personally deal with, so that's not happening, like, <laughs> today. Can, anyway, can that's the that story. Live recording, yeah. On the art book. Yeah, that's that's very cool. I mean, the 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 art you're referring to, the kind of the screenshot, almost is like reminiscent of like a, I don't know, like a storyboard for like a DreamWorks or Disney film, you know. And mm -hmm. it it has that like vibe of like, oh, what if, what if one of those, you know. Um, yeah, they went. Yeah, what if they went that other path? You know, like, right? Like what? I mean, like, but what if, or what if one of these major companies, aside from Illumination, got a hold uh, of these properties? Um, of course, we are getting the Illumination Mario 
film at some point. Um, mm-hmm. At least that's oh, what. Yeah. And will probably, that be yeah. art? You know, you have to ask yourself. <laughs> Hard Woo. to say. If there are minions, then obviously, yeah, of that's... course. Yeah. <laughs> it's no world of yeah. pets or whatever. It'll but never top that '90s Mario movie. That's a work of art. <laughs> they're brothers. They're plumbers. <laughs> oh no. Uh, Odyssey art book, just the cover. I love just like the sketch work and all the different, uh, you know, you see the character profiles and all the way that would be distributed via the marketing material and different poses and frames and outfits. And, right. you know, it's just uh, fun. Something I've enjoyed that both um, Mario Kart Deluxe and New Super Mario Brothers uh, U Deluxe have done is they've taken like these little the little symbols and iconography and put them like on the loading screens. Like, you know, in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, there's like the really awesome, like all these different raceway insignia you know that come across on the loading right. screen and uh, mm-hmm. they do a similar thing in new super mario brothers uh u deluxe but the it kind of has that vibe and that look of this kind of fun mashup of all these different little icons it's cute enjoy yeah it. yeah um god these books the books are super cool um so yeah i i need to check out that splatoon one honestly i didn't know that existed i want to dive into that I, sure I, does. I just, you have Exactly, just um, hop dive right, right in, into that, hop in that squid form, and uh, take goodness. at your local library. <laughs> I'm gonna gonna be a kid. All right, so moving on to our second story. It's a Nintendo's 130th birthday. Um, okay, here uh, we go. Three, two, one. Danny, take us, kick us off. Here we go. Happy, Happy birthday! Oh, this will be an individual Mr. video. Cut this one into zone. That was good, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so the Guardian got an interview with two uh, uh, Nintendo veterans. Uh, I'm going to try to pronounce their names here. So uh, the current uh, lead on the Nintendo Switch, Mr. Uh, Shinya Takahashi. Um, so this gentleman has been like um, not necessarily the face of the Switch that we would see often in directs. Um, However, we definitely have seen this individual. He will show up here. Uh, mm-hmm. As well as Hishashi Nogami. Here we go! Both of these individuals, uh, longtime Nintendo vets, uh, have been around since Nintendo's uh, GameCube uh, days. Um, uh, and they kind of interviewed with The Guardian around what their experience has been like in, uh, working at Nintendo. They obviously haven't been here for, you know, for over the 130 year period but they've been able to describe nintendo's kind of uh you know time as a game company and how they've kind of adapted and how they've gotten younger um and so i got a few quotes i just kind of want to pull from this article Uh, again this is by the guardian and i wanted to kind of just kind of get your thoughts on this Uh, so the first quote is um you know they're kind of talking about what they used to experience in terms of uh you know of what they look for and how you know whether a game is good or not so uh, Mr. Takahashi was saying, what we used to do was look at people's faces uh, while they were playing. Um, of course, this was the time before social media when people could share how, you know, this is what I felt about this. They didn't have that. So uh, Takahashi says, when I was younger, uh, when the games I was involved with were eventually released, I would go to some of the toy stores and sneak a look at people's faces while they played. Uh, if people look surprised or happy, and if they laugh, I'd think, yes, we did it. Which is like the most Nintendo thing to say uh ever um so we're kind of just describing about like what what it took then they go on to say it's not good enough to just put your idea into words uh you really have to give people a concrete example to show them how it works uh and uh, his partner nogami agreed and he said it's 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 on us to create things that allow the players to experience that wow moment and so they're describing uh the switch and they even kind of give some vignettes on how even when they introduced the Wii and the Wii controller, that even their own internal developers were like, what is this? And like a lot of people constantly in within Nintendo are doubting the, you know, the products that they're putting forward, the development team for the hardware is putting forward. Um, and so they said that they've gotten really good at finding ways to make sure that the developers in Nintendo can get a real feel for this, like, you know, and pr- a proof mm-hmm. of concept um yeah you so, uh i go. wanted to comment kind of on my gut reaction to those because back in the day i worked at a video game retailer uh, myself and it does kind of remind me of just like the thought of people playing it and smiling and engaging their reaction but it feels like a memory kind of of yesteryear now i don't know if that's more just because our age um and maybe this is still an experience that younger kids have but the video game store like demo disc was like definitely mm-hmm. 
remember very exciting like back in the yeah. gamecube day you'd go and they'd have you know maybe a dozen games featured and like three of them would have demos and the rest of them have like the trailer mm -hmm. but that was really the only way to reliably get that content it was a long time to download things uh, on the right. internet it wasn't something you might have had access to readily it certainly wasn't on your phone um but i remember just like the experience of playing even games like custom robo i'm being really excited about the demo oh, that i played man. that i wouldn't have encountered Deep otherwise cut. Well. wow <laughs> or like uh you know, super some of the Mario sports games that I probably never actually bought myself, but like would experience have these short memories of um, because I played them on a demo disc and how exciting that was. And I do feel like now when I, you know, just like graze the aisles wandering through a target, which is kind of part of my nightly ritual, right. um, you know, I, I do feel like it's fairly vacant. You don't see a ton of people like on the PS4 or like on the Xbox. And, you know, occasionally they're occasionally probably younger kids are on there, but really... I feel like they're, if anything, they're just kind of big monitors that have running trailers of Amiibo and things like that. And you don't really see people engaging with it the same way, probably because they're access to demos and people have devices that can play games and playing right. a demo probably is less appealing. But uh, it, do, it does make me smile to, to read about that being the way in which they gauged kind of their reaction. How about you? Any strong memories of the, the demos of, of the past? I remember playing, uh, like, going in with a friend when Mario Double Dash was being demoed at one of the, like, you know, the GameStop, like, uh, GameCube setup that they had. And I was someone who would go to Funko Land or GameStop or whatever, you know, whatever EB Games, toy store, EBX, EB, Babbage, oh, EB Games, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. all of those little game stores that had them. And I, I would... The ones that were local or close, my brothers and I, or friends and I, would ride our bikes to them and sit there and play these games when we didn't have enough money to buy them or if someone didn't have mm -hmm. the console. And I remember playing Double Dash for like hours in a GameStop. So much yeah. so that the owner, or the owner, one of the, I think one of the managers, or the shift managers, basically had to tell us, like, hey, you gotta give other people a chance <laughs> gotta, to play this thing. <laughs> Mario and Spirit are very tired. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, the fact that, like, like maybe. Mr. Uh, Takahashi, like, at some point is in, like, a Japanese game store, like, just, like, kind of enjoying, like, young fans, mm -hmm. like, having such a good time with something that you made. Like, it's, I mean, uh, it's kind of and, cool. It's definitely a product of here. And you still you still yeah. see um, kind of the one other, one other theme of this article is that Nintendo kind of trying to embrace more of a uh, contemporary approach to people and how the people engage with one another, how people might play online or use social media or how games have changed and game design ch changes and you kind of see even in that example uh, how they're approaching it now something that i've had fun watching is uh at e3 or when they do like nintendo directs they'll, they will record people watching like the live stream at the nintendo world store yeah. in new york yeah. and so there was that great one from e3 uh i guess now last year's e3 when they announced ridley and ice climbers i guess that was back in mm, 2018 mm -hmm. and yeah. um and it was funny to see everyone's reaction because Nobody made like there was barely a peep about Ridley because I think it's a character that only like maybe Metroid fans enjoy, which is not a huge selling series. Versus like Ice Climbers, people like lost their minds as people have, you know, just the memory of playing. I'm sure on right. in Melee and Brawl, and uh, not like there's any love for the NES game, which is trash. Uh, but the, it's fun <laughs> that they're kind of taking that together. People's excitement, you know, experiencing something together, but also the social media aspect because it's on Twitter, and you see that in their game design. Um, and you know, with Breath of the Wild, there was a long time where for the Nintendo, especially of the Wii U generation, uh, th they would be asked, hey, did you guys play Skyrim? Or like these big tentpole games. And their reaction would always be like, no, like we don't, we don't play that. You yeah. know, we're playing just our Nintendo things or they're just, you know, living and working within the Nintendo environment. They didn't stray because yeah. that was kind of, they wanted to focus on their own Nintendo charm. And you really see with the Switch and Breath of the Wild, a uh, willingness to incorporate, learn something from Dark Souls or from Skyrim or something, you know, The mm -hmm. Witcher, things that, you see these little influences just in the same way that Zelda influenced them originally. Um, and well, I think it's I think, been instructive for them. I think, and I think you Possibly. bring up a good point because they, you know, they start to talk about, uh, this article talks about really about the youth of, of uh, Nintendo and how, um, like, take this quote, for example. Uh, in the same way that Nintendo games have now been enjoyed by generations of players, they are made by different generations of developers. Uh, uh, Junichi Masuda, uh, one of Pokemon's original creators, now works alongside 30-year-old developers who once traded Pokemon cards in the playground, which is basically the three of us here. Um, and so <laughs> it's, you know, and it, 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 what you just said, Austin, is right. Like, that's a testament to, like, Nintendo 
is listening to these things now because they have, they have millennials, basically, who are working for them, who grew up playing not just Nintendo games, but all these other games that they're enjoying. Especially, I mean, they're 30-year-olds. They're still playing. They're like, they're part of this. Uh, the, a millennial generation is a gaming generation. And they are also going home and playing PlayStation 4 games and Xbox games on top sure. of Nintendo stuff. And I think they're bringing that, that passion and energy for games uh, and the, you know, the, the different things they've experienced into it. So, um, and it's actually kind of funny because they kind of go on to talk about how uh, Miyamoto has be kind of kind of become like this like legend within Nintendo just because yeah I can't imagine youth like <laughs> us that, that <laughs> like are uh, they they go on to like say I don't, I don't have this direct quote but they're kind of talk about how like well like us old guys like we we know, we all know each other like you know like we none of us really see you know Miyamoto as this like godlike figure but the the millennials of the of the you know of our developing. Teams. he's their obi-wan <laughs> yeah and yeah. they're like so they actually go on and describe him a little bit they go you know it's what do they say here uh uh so he's not involved in the minute uh the minute to minute details of development but he does oversee entire projects and identifies major issues uh and they kind of go on the quote like the, they're saying like oh he'll say this this is bad and this is bad and this is bad i love that i love it and, just the crotchety old <laughs> mr miyamoto yeah. coming out there right. and just like Dunking on Straight people's shooter. projects, yeah, like, just, yeah. yeah, that's trash, <laughs> right? Um, and, and had a little kids, more I remember my first there. video game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Takahashi goes on. He says, uh, "If he if he says something good, it's rare, and you know it, and you know it is. He's actually a shy person. Even when he thinks something is well done, he won't often say that to someone directly." Uh, and then Nogami chimes in. He goes, I've never once been praised by Mr. Miyamoto. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently he says it like deadpan to the, yeah, to I the love interviewer. That. I love that. Um, so finally, they kind of end the article by saying, uh, you know, this, the, on this quote, they go, 30 years ago, uh, if we asked the question, do you play games? The answer might have been yes or no, uh, Takahashi said. Uh, now, if we ask that same question, the great majority of people are going on to say yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes on to say, we are trying to entertain all of these people. Uh, like a swan, we look elegant above the surface, but underneath the water, we might be paddling like crazy. Yeah, I uh, thought that was, a, that was a beautiful analogy I've not yeah. heard beautiful, before. Beautiful, classy little Never phrase. before, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I really liked that. And I, I'm sure it's true. I liked that little quote in there, too, where he says that, you know, people don't know how much work goes into a game, but, you know, maybe it's better that they don't. You know, it's like, and to some yeah. degree, it's like how the sausage is made, and you hear a lot of the stories coming out of 2018 about crunch and the negative work environment yeah. for all these games. But I think even oh, beside yeah. that, it's just like I know for myself, um, a perfect example, uh, I feel, is that for like a link between worlds on 3DS, right? right. Loved that game. Like a wonderful game, great throwback to Link to the Past. I have really strong memories of finishing it, talking to you, Matt, about your experience yeah. with it. And, um, so I think back very f fondly about it. However, there is when they were doing like kind of the Iwata asks and kind of these behind the scenes, uh, one thing they showed off, which was very open of them and I appreciate it and which kind of showed a new Nintendo less closed up. But um, they showed that in fact, all the character models in A Link Between Worlds, you were, even though you're looking, you know, straight down on them in order to achieve that 3D effect and still track the motion of your character or the uh, directionality, I suppose, of the movement, uh, all the characters we're like standing basically at like a 45 degree like yeah. decline, I suppose. Like, so they were wow. always like walking like this, kind of looking up a little bit. So you'd have that 3D effect, but still be able to see their feet and their head yeah. kind of thing. And, um, but now whenever I think of that game, I always think of the images they shared where it's just like crazy link, like leaning backwards really yeah, heavily, like, like walking forward. And it's like the same thing <laughs> where when you see games, that are first person in it, like they'll show how the camera, the virtual camera is rigged on the model and it'll be like, you know, a pair of feet arms and then just like a camera that's like at chest height, you know, so you can like see the gun like this. Right. And it's just like, you know, there's no, you know, doom guy there or whatever. And um, it always is like cool to see it. The other hand, it's like it does take away an element of the yeah, magic and especially yeah. Nintendo games that are so patch free largely, you know, they really come out and they're done. You don't have any crazy Assassin's Creed Unity moment or what have you, or it's like big patch needed to come in because, you mm -hmm. know, the character model and Peach's face fell off in Super Mario Brothers Ultimate. Like, that never <laughs> happens. And so, um, just the, the one time, it was fine. Just one time, and we all got over, no, but the, you know, it doesn't happen. And so I think, I, I also appreciate that kind of, there, you know, just the philosophy of that, you know, maybe it's better people don't understand how it's made, then we just want to have them experience the fun right. and the magic of it. And also, 
I think Keza McDonald, who wrote this article for The Guardian, she was formerly at IGN and then in Kotaku UK. Um, so she's been really prolific in the space, and it's a great article. Mm-hmm. And I think she does a nice job, too, talking about the different ages. And I know, like, Danny, you and I have been enjoying Pokemon Go recently. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. <clears throat> something that Pokemon Go just started is there are uh, daily, like, lunch hour raids. So at noon, there's, like, all these raid bosses that spawn at all the gyms. For, for millennials people, like, on their, their phones break, right? at work. And yeah, right. so I was at one of the hospitals I work at today, and uh, there was like a traveling pack of like 19 people that were going from like stop to stop during that hour. And it's people like I'm the youngest one there, people of all ages, um, all different backgrounds. And it's like awesome. You know, it's awesome to have this type of community. It's awesome. These people know Dialga, you know, like it's just mm-hmm, like yeah. it's so fun for me to think that. And I would say when I play locally, like the majority of people playing are. I would say middle-aged women, sometimes with their families too, and they're like, so you have this young generation, this old generation. Um, it it's just you know middle-aged people as well. It's just like a great amalgam of all these different uh, personality types. I think Nintendo's done a nice job embracing that. The Switch feels like that, like the Wii in that way. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's that's pretty cool. Like uh, the fact that the you know Pokemon Go has attracted such a wide audience and. I think that's a testament to Nintendo franchises in general. And um, that's so funny that they would do that. A lunch hour, mm-hmm. like, like game update that's like so targeted at the working class, which is <laughs> for sure, you know, a lot it's of awesome. the generation like, generations that grew people, up with Pokemon. You know, these people that probably would have no exposure to Discord, you know, a gaming, gaming app we're all using. I right. was, my friends were using it, you know, I don't know, two or three years ago to, for Dota 2. I was not, I'm not a PC gamer, never used it, but. I'm on there for Pokemon Go. These families are on there for Pokemon Go. These parents are on there for Pokemon Go. That's awesome. It's so cool. Yeah. They have this thing where these people are totally hardcore. I'm way out of my depth. They're way better than this game than I am. Like, <laughs> and they know they have a you know they have they're into the meta game. They want the shiny. They know the perfect IV calculation to get uh, for this mm-hmm. Pokemon. Like they're experts at it. And I it you know it's awesome that it brings them in. They're passionate. They're also moving around because of Pokemon Go. Yeah. And I think Nintendo. <laughs> Get your steps in. Yeah, but similar, I you know appreciate that they're kind of a, a face of family gaming and kind of just you know cross age divides and things. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, seeing so Danny came over at, uh, with his Pokemon Go uh, recently, had it opened up. My the the building I live in is a Pokestop um, mm. or a mm. gym, right? The gym, Pokestop. Correct me. Uh, no, it's a stop. It's stop. a stop. Okay. So yeah, they got a stop here, and I remember when it first came out, like. Oh my gosh, there was stuff happening, and I was like, "This is yeah. perfect." I sit in my living room, and I'm Boom. constantly at a stop. It. Never are, have to leave, baby. That's never the dream. Have to leave. But I came back and saw Danny playing, and I thought that was just so cool. That like starting up with Pokemon Let's Go again, and kind of getting getting that like having that be the bridge for you to get back into Pokemon Go. And I think it's such a cool community. Like, there's part of me that like definitely wants to play, but I just I just I I know but myself. You know, <laughs> I sure. need to but not only do made it. it like easier and easier. Like there's all these community yeah, events. Yeah, and I'm sure it's event, like way like better week. than it was at, what a year or two years yeah, ago it when it runs first launched. fairly yes. stably. But it just has so much more to collect yeah. and to find and to battle yeah. and to trade and the friend things. Like yeah. it's way easier to make progress. Um, yeah, it's very friendly, yeah. but also there's reasons why you might want to. You know, pick up a little microtransaction here or there and get a couple <laughs> incubators going. And, That's um, how they do super it. Super fun. Anyway. So really, let's get really to our last story. Okay, um, and Danny, I really want to get your take on this because you're actually the one who brought this to our attention initially. So sure. uh, Nintendo Labo, uh, for, uh, initially this week it was rumored like Nintendo might be revealing um, their iteration of vr they're gonna jump into vr and of course yeah we got the news that it would uh take the form of a nintendo labo kit we have nintendo labo vr um yeah and so i kind of just pulled some information but it's uh from their website but it's going to drop on april 12th uh there's going to be a couple of kits like kind of an all-encompassing kit a smaller kit with a blaster and then of course like two uh uh what do you call them um like almost like DLC, but not DLC expansions. That's what they're called. Mm, right, expansion yes, one, right, expansion two. <laughs> yeah. And so, okay. So Nintendo Labo VR uh, is the fourth kit in the Nintendo Labo series, and it offers six new Toy-Con creations, uh, including the Toy-Con VR goggles, which is going to be required for, I mean, that's the concept for all of them, mm-hmm. which combine with other creations to allow players to interact with virtual worlds through imaginative real world actions. Uh, so they kind of go off into like a, 
fend off alien invasion with the Toy-Con Blaster, or visit colorful in-game ocean and snap photos, a la Pokemon Snap, Welcome back. Uh, of the sea life with Toy-Con <laughs> camera, <laughs> and so much more. Anyway, so if you played any of the, the Toy-Con games, like, motor, like, like Sight Bike, like Motorcycle One, and some of the other ones, like, they're, they're cool concepts, and it's interesting to see that this is Nintendo's, like, first venture into VR with this, and mm-hmm. obviously feels like a test of what potential future hardware could do for them with a device like this. Yeah. So uh, initially, what are, you guys, what are you guys' thoughts on this? VR. Yeah. Nintendo. Yeah. I mean, it, it, first of all, I mean, it very much looks like Google Cardboard. Do you guys remember that from yeah, a couple yeah, years yeah. ago? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, it's like, okay, that, that's just like right there for the taking. Um, but no, I mean, it's, you know, we know that Labo hasn't sold like, like they hoped. Like they hoped that it would be like this new thing that was like so weird and so different and so Nintendo that it would like just sell like gangbusters. It's, it's, I don't even think it's in the top 20 maybe of Nintendo first party published stuff. Um, but what I will say is that this is this is also Nintendo in creating something new and still pushing forward with it, right? You know, they made the Wii U gamepad and everyone's like, do we need that? What's the purpose of it? They didn't give up on it. I mean, they made some really great games on the Wii U that are now being remade for the Switch because they know, you know, while there were a giant install base, they know that these games like uh, people enjoyed them, people enjoyed the Wii U. So this is something that while it may not be like hitting the masses like crazy right now, they're pushing forward as best they can with it. Um, Cause you know, down the road, this is gonna be something when we get to switch 2.0, they come out with a really like meaningful right. purpose to Labo stuff. So it still kind of feels like, you know, version 1.0 in general, kind of getting some ideas out there, but think about it. I mean, you get that VR headset. They said, you're going to have a little blaster you can buy with it. There is the duck hunt remake, you know, right in front of you. You have this, that's such a great kind of VR experience. Um, Pokemon Snap, you know, now, I mean, we joke, that's a great idea to um, to get that in now. I mean, because you were always moving with the camera in that game to try to get the perfect image. Um, that's that's right there. Um, and then the the less serious but also kind of cool and worrisome thing is that now this is where they release uh, the Netflix streaming app. And now you <laughs> literally don't have to leave your virtual world ever again. Perfect. And you're just I'll sucked you. in. So. There. Yeah, I... <laughs> I think it's a well, yeah, well, well summarized. And I, I think out of the four toy concepts we've seen so far, this is like the one I would look into. Like, right. um, and I, you know, Nintendo has a background in making crazy peripherals, right? The classic one is mm-hmm. the Wii Vitality Sensor that never came out. And, um, <laughs> but they have always made things like this. You look at the blaster that comes with this, and it's reminiscent of the uh, Lynx crossbow training accessory yeah. that came out for the Wii, right? Or like the love tester back of Nintendo of 130 <laughs> years ago, or the extender arm, and they have this crazy toy maker mentality. And um, but kind of like you're saying, Danny, I I want them to do this too because when I want them to bridge Labo, and I maybe it's because I'm just like a simple man, maybe, and I just like don't want to do anything unless it has my plumber boy on it. But like I want them to bridge their ip with labo more so right now the only one we've seen is that mario kart 8 deluxe has that labo use the steering Mm -hmm. motorcycle thing uh which is awesome that they've done that but like there's still a disconnect right because they're in that motorcycle kit you can like make your own level which is awesome but you can't bring that into mario kart 8 you know but if you put them together that would be so neat like yeah and a lot of these I love it where it's like the expansions, like you mentioned, Matt, there's an elephant and a wind pedal. Right. Like they're very strange, um, singular items, but that's like so Nintendo and toy like, and it's very cool. Um, but it would be great to see like, let's see that blaster used for Lex Crossbow Training 2 or something that yeah. applies some of these brands in like a fun new way. Um, and also like you mentioned with the Google Cardboard or even like the Google Daydream, the VR for the Pixel, like I think a strength of this you know, you look at everyone using it. Clearly, you have to hold it up to your head, right? Because the switch is going to be kind of heavy. Mm-hmm. They don't want you dropping it. And there's no yeah, strap there's or anything. No strap at all. Yeah, that's right. But but that Yet. said, like, I have a PlayStation VR and I, I like it. I'm you know, impressed with the technology. It's great for like a consumer level. I don't have a big PC. However, like I have Tetris Effect and I want to play it with that VR experience, but I don't want to take out the four separate cords, the, the breakout processor box, right. the two move mm-hmm. controllers, sync them back up, make sure they're charged, yeah. the micro USB. Like, it's so involved. This is so simple and perfect. That's, I would love and, it 
if Nintendo, the people who made the Virtual Boy, right? This <laughs> it looks very Virtual Boy. It's just you know basically just the stand itself, um, where you're the stand of the Virtual Boy. But the I would love it if they you know just a little a little crossover. If if an expansion yeah. was Zelda themed and it was just like walk around you know oh, it, it would one sell of the so cities well. in Breath of the Wild like. I would totally yeah. check that out. Like, that'd oh, be yeah. so fun. I don't expect it to be fully immersive. We had to gauge our expectations appropriately. Like, it'll be very simple. It will not look like, you know, full 3R, you know, motion. I mean, there will be motion tracking, I suppose, because of the Switch itself. But it's not going to right. be super in- intensive. And you can't use your hands, obviously. It's just looking around. But that's okay. Most VR games, even on PSVR, the bet- one of my favorites is bet- the Batman Arkham game. And that's really like, you go to a perch. You look around, you go to the other perch, you look around because the walking and VR together is challenging and nauseating. So yeah. you could do a lot of those experiences in Nintendo World. What if you put it on? It already looks a bit like Samus's visor, you know? You put it on there and you get a look around. Right, that's like, pretty cool. You know, the Planet Zebes, like that would be so neat. Um, or I, even I think as little downloadable experiences. Yeah, exactly, right? Like Nintendo is def- when it ever whenever it comes to like technology, um, you know, uh, advancements in entertainment that other companies are like really trying to pre- pursue, but then release ex- super expensive iterations of like Nintendo always likes to, you know, not jump necessarily into the game. They're doing the R and D, but they don't want to jump in until it's accessible. Um, and uh, they find a way to make it fun. And like, it's great to see them now, like acknowledge like, Hey, VR is a, it could be a, a big part of our future. Our console is modular enough to, also have this in its repertoire but what it like but it has to be fun and this is it's just nice to see them think like t- thinking like the, the most what's the most simple way we can get vr out there and ignoring the like the whole like headset thing you know like that that to me is such a nintendo thing that no you just have to hold it up to your face and you get to have this mm-hmm. this a joyful experience like to me that's like that's a, such a nintendo thing and so um i agree with everything you both said i definitely want to see it like it's going to sell so much better if they tie it into some Nintendo properties. And I have to imagine the cardboard and the stuff, like all the, all the production behind it, probably, they're probably still making money off anything that they're doing. But um, I, want, I want to see it kind of have a, I don't know, a better, um, like, just era within Nintendo's history. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to be able to look back at, like, the, the Nintendo Labo days and remember, like, oh, yeah, that was... Like, we also got into that. It wasn't for uh, older millennials with kids or older generations with children or, you know, the, the, the engineers of, you know, Nintendo's fandom. It was for everyone. And it, although it is, it hasn't, hasn't had that reach yet. But it's certainly, I think, like, I might pick up the zapper and the mm-hmm. headset. Yeah, because, the base one. Yeah, exactly. Because I want VR on my... Like the first iteration of VR from Nintendo, and I think that's going to be super cool. And I wouldn't be surprised uh, second, if that second really iteration. Well. Don't, don't oh, virtual boy. Excuse me. Excuse me. Let's say the first <laughs> successful iteration. <laughs> At least more right, successful. Right. If uh, it gets more than those dozen games, then yes. Yeah. But all right, really quick. Yeah. One property. You have all the money, all the power in the world of Nintendo. One property it's not currently paired with that you could pair it with. Go. Ooh, that's so good. Uh. Man, I would love, I think I could see it in Animal Crossing where you put it on, you get to explore uh, the house, someone's house, like upstairs, mm-hmm. downstairs, like see all the, sit on the furniture, all that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. Just like a way, just like in the 3DS game, you can go to someone's village and, you know, check out their house. Yeah, what if you could just do a house tour, virtual house tour, right. just like you can do now yeah. on Zillow or what have you, just kind of scroll <laughs> right. through. <laughs> right, Um College okay, dormitory I will do website. For mine, yeah. Metroid Prime, obviously excited for four. And what a great way to promote that game, a series that Nintendo definitely wants to promote, wants to make it a major headlining sales, uh, you know, first person shooter adventure game for their platform. And <laughs> what better way than to tie in these little experiences where what if you could use a blaster just to, you know, shoot at shoot ice missiles at Metroids as they fly at you in some type right. of like small area. Or, you know, those games when you land on each planet, they're you know, it's so beautiful and that does such a great job with the kind of setting uh setting the mood yeah. and the scene and the, 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 the music planet, and yeah. the water effects and the games always has such a fun like there's fog on the visor and you see samus's reflection or things like that like how fun would it be just to have an immersive you're standing on top of her starship looking around that would just you know be a great like you already have it here's a download for it look forward to the game yeah. coming out you know 2020 2030 yeah. yeah i think i'm going with 
uh, Pokemon Snap remake, but it looks like the animation from Detective Pikachu, (laughs) and you actually have a Ryan Reynolds voice sidekick with you the whole time, and as you're taking pictures, oh, that's very snappy, Mm -hmm. very snappy. I would even (laughs) take Oak if if he's like, excellent, or whatever he's saying. (laughs) Uh, Perfect. Perfect. Watch out for my nephew. You were close. (laughs) All right, so, um, yeah. This has been a good uh, another Nintendo podcast. We're going to call it their boys. Um, we're going to come back with some more episodes around all things Pokemon. Uh, some uh, we got we got Yoshi's coming out soon. We've played a bunch of games. I beat Wargroove and haven't talked about that. Oh yet. my so gosh! Wow, there's a so lot. Great. Yeah, on hard mode the entire time. So here we go. Wow. We have a lot to talk about in the future. So thanks for joining us on ANP. You can find us on YouTube right here. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some videos out soon. Um, we're also on any streaming service for uh, podcasts. We got I- iTunes, um, Android. Cast pods, I don't know what they call it. We got a, <laughs> yep, you're doing great. You Google that. Play Store run SoundCloud, check them out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having you. So please, you know, consider subscribing or throwing a like our way. It would make our day. And uh, you know, come check. Tell us, us what again. we can do better too. I mean, let us know. I mean, we're we're enjoying this. We're we're not trying to get millions of fans. We're just trying to have a good time. And we'd like uh, a dozen. Like we'd like one fine. dozen just, just fans. One million. You know what? If you you comment like... on the video, we are good for a response. We get in there and we reply very aggressively. And so you could start. You could yeah. start up a friendship with three. Three delightful young men. You found on the internet. Nothing, exactly. nothing bad about that. So thanks so much. This has been another Nintendo podcast, and we will see you in yet another Nintendo podcast. Goodbye. <laughs>